Good morning to you. Good morning. Well, I'm on the mic. So um, if you can't understand what I'm saying, then please go to the person that's got an interpretation of Tom's next to you, <laughs> ask them to interpret and they will do so. But it's wonderful to be with you. It's great to be asked to come and do a part of the series, God and the world and us. And the rich and the poor is what I'm going to be attempting to tackle a little bit today. But uh, I suppose I should tell you a little bit about me when, the, when we'd be caught. So I, I was stood there in the corner going, you're nicking my sermon. Everything God's saying is on point. And somebody came up to me as we were praying, I think it was it Andy, it is another Andy, came up to me and said, I've just got something I want to say to you that I found more. So as we were praying, I just want more. And it's this. Just Abraham. That was it, wasn't it? Just Abraham. Take, take it back what you want. Take it back what you will. Just Abraham. And then everybody gets up and talks about all these great heroes of faith. And I think sometimes we go, well, I can't be us. We can't be like that. That's not, that's not where we are. We're just us. And I'm sure Abraham said that. I'm sure Abraham said that. Well, who am I that you would use me? And the whole point is, God uses who we will, including all of us. And I have to say, I have so far really enjoyed just the welcome and the love that's in this place. Knowing only a handful of you, many of you, those under 18, <laughs> um, it is, uh, it's been my privilege to uh, to be asked to come today. So who am I? So uh, is, is this working or is it? No. Uh, yeah, we, have we lost see, the graphic? Turn the stick back in. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Just know when this is happening. So I've got to be really quick with this, I've got to kind of just rattle through because uh, I know that as a guest speaker I've only got an hour, so... Only an hour. Oh dear, oh so, so, so. So who am I? Well, I'll tell you who I am. There would be a graphic up there with me preaching in front of a pair of underpants. Um, <laughs> There was a context to it, so but some people might say that I speak a load of pants, but hopefully that won't be the case today. I'm the pastor of a, a church, the Coach House Church in Stockport, just outside Manchester. A church that I've attended and oh there we go. A church that I attended and I got saved at when I was 17. So I've been in the church for 42 years. Now you can work out ages and things from that. Um, so 42 years I've been in the church. My only church, and now it's my privilege to, to look after it, and it's an amazing, amazing privilege. I'm married to Mel, we have two sons, one who lives in Birmingham, who's training to be a pastoral work in the church there, and another Matthew, who works with David Allison as their youth worker in Blackpool. So you all know David Allison, I think David Allison, I remember David coming to our church as a punk and getting saved. <laughs> okay, and, and uh, we were... David Allison's wedding at our church as well. So that's a little bit about me, but I've been asked to talk to you about your series, God, the World and Us. So let's have a look at the context of the world that we live in, because if we don't understand this, we're really not going to understand a great deal of anything else that, uh, that anyone tell, says to us. So this is our world, how it looks today, and where we exist in it, according to God's Word, the Bible. So... The question that we have to ask is, how do we navigate ourselves through this time in the middle, this time that we exist in? This is the gap between Jesus' ascension when he was walking on this earth and his return, which we've sung about today. This is the time of the church, or as the Bible calls it, the end time. We are in a place and we live in a world which is marred by sin and decay. Not just a creation, not just the things that uh, I'm sure you looked at last week. I think you looked at environment last week, is that right? And you will have seen how the environment is just decaying. What do we do about it? It feels a little bit hopeless, doesn't it? But we live in a world, not just of creation, which is marred by sin and decay. Because also, when we look around, we see that actually our lives, our morals, our relationships, they are also all marred by sin and decay. 
You see, the further that we move away from God's ideals for us, away from what he says in his word, the more that we will encounter moral conundrums about our behaviour. And now this is especially true for Christians, believers in Jesus. As Jesus seems to turn most of the rules of the world that we live in on its head. The rules of the kingdom life, they appear to be upside down to the reality that we find ourselves living in. We will constantly find ourselves in life going against the tide. Have you ever felt like this? I'm sure the government of our country feels like this right now. Okay, and we only have to look around at the questionable behaviour governing us. Okay, and we're not being political. It's just the world we live in. It's just, and I think any government actually would act immorally. Unless we get a really saved government in place. It's a sad indictment of today's society that as more and more of us are struggling with death and are falling into the poverty trap, we are bombarded with... Anybody watch TV in the day? Daytime TV. It's aimed at certain people. It's aimed at people who are watching their TV in the day. And we are bombarded with opportunities to become rich. You ever noticed it? And the more we decline into poverty, the more we are tempted with riches. Whether it's bingo, come and have a, have a go on online bingo, come and make some money, and we'll even give you some free spins to tempt you in, or it's the lottery. It's sad that in dark times the poor are further and further exploited with the temptation to become rich. And it plays to our fallen nature. It plays to our human nature. I want to escape from the place that I'm in. I want to be rich. I want to be up there, because that seems to be the place to be. We aspire to be rich. What Jesus says and teaches those who are listening to the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew 5, blessed are the poor. Jesus also taught his disciples and his, and a young man who came to him for salvation. He had everything going for him. And in the end, Jesus had to say to him, look, it's easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than it is for a rich man to enter heaven. And the disciples were so taken aback by this statement. They were so kind of what is going on with this thinking. What this is turning the world upside down, that they were absolutely... You were just, what is going on? What are you saying? Who can be saved then? So before we go any further, let's just draw some of this thing. Let's just draw it in so we can focus our mind's eye on where we are, are today. You see, our mind's, our mind's eye will always associate rich and poor with a monetary value. Always. So if you say to somebody, let's talk about rich, let's talk about poor, we will always think about gosh. Louds our money. We'll always think about that's just in our psyche. It's what it's about. I'm rich if I've got loads of money, and I'm poor if I haven't. And the Bible seems to support the opposite notion. It seems to support that being poor is a blessing, and that being rich is a bit of a problem. However, as the Bible scholars that you are, you will be aware that the greater context of Jesus' teaching is to draw our conclusion, or draw us to the conclusion, that it's the state of our spirit, our soul, that really determines whether we are rich or whether we are poor. This doesn't mean, however, that the Bible is silent about injustices that we see around us, even if it's with regard to the unequal distribution of resources, including wealth. Far from it. God hates injustice. Okay? All the way through the Bible, God hates injustice. And he hates it with a passion. And he promises that he will bring an end to it. And that's why we need to understand where we exist and what's coming. What's been behind us, what's coming, and where we are now. Amos 5 is a prophecy that warns and promises in the same breath. 
A call to repentance of God's people for not living up to the standards that he has laid out. In verse 6 of Amos 5, the Lord says, Come back to the Lord and live. Come back to me and live. And here is what God is calling them to repent of. You twist justice. You're making it a bitter pill for the oppressed. You treat the, treat, you treat the righteous like dirt. Amos continues. How you hate honest judges. How you despise people who tell the truth. You trample the poor. Stealing their grain through taxes and unfair rent. God then shows his displeasure at his people's actions. I hate all of your show and pretense. The hypocrisy of your religious festivals and your solemn assemblies. I will not accept your burnt offerings and grain offerings. Can you imagine having our worship this morning? And singing with all of the gusto we've got and all of the all of the passion that we can generate, we sing at the top of our voices, and God going, not listening, don't want to know, because I'm looking at your heart, and this isn't your heart; it's just your voice. I will not accept your burnt offerings and grain offerings. I won't even notice all your choice peace offerings. Away with your whole noisy hymns of praise. I will not listen to the music of your harps. Instead, instead, I want to see a mighty flow of justice. An endless river of righteous living. This is scripture, folks. We can't get away from this. God's people ended up experiencing captivity because they just did not listen to what God was saying to them. Come back to me. We were talking last night. We were talking last night, and we were we were talking about the fact that it's really strange that no, I'm not even going to say it. Forget it. I'm going to stay on here. I'm going to stay on here. So I'll be able to. Teased you in. I can't even call myself, you know. <laughs> no, let's leave it. God's people ended up experiencing captivity and the loss of all that they had because they failed to act with justice. Now I've told you this because I want you to see the difference between God's ideals and our standards. Okay, because believe it or not, we've got standards, our own standards. And they simply do not match with God's standards. They just, they're so out of kilter. It's unbelievable. So you'll have looked at the environment last week and you will have found that, hey, what we're doing to this planet is way out of kilter with what God intends for us to do with it. What he intended with it at the beginning when he gave it to us, to tend and to warn and to look after. And what are we doing? We're trashing it. Okay, we've looked at what all this looks like from God's perspective. So what does it look like for us now? How do we deal with injustices of wealth distribution in particular? Well, we're called to be salt and light in this world, the world in which we live. As Christians, you are salt and light. You are supposed to make a difference. You are supposed to bring Jesus into the communities that you find yourself. You are supposed to change lives by being salt and by being light. And that's in the time that we live in. So before the fullness of God's separation and the bringing to be of all of the promises, in the gap that we live in, we are supposed to bring the taste of heaven down to this earth, down to the society, down to the communities in which we live. Because make no mistake, we will be returning, God is going to return us back to a place of perfect justice, a place with a perfect world, a place where there is no rich and poor, a place where there is no distinction, and there is no temptation to throw it away. 
That's where we're headed, but we're not there yet. Jesus makes an interesting statement to his followers when an expensive jar of perfume is used to annoy him. I'm sure you all know this particular story. Matthew 26, verses 8 to 13, if you want to make a note of that, I'll follow it in Bibles. <coughs> an expensive jar of perfume is poured onto Jesus' head. And the disciples shout, what a waste. It could have been sold for a high price and the money given to the poor. But Jesus, aware of this, replied, Why criticise this woman for doing such a good thing to me? You will always have the poor among you, but you will not always have me. She has poured this perfume on me to prepare my body for burial, and I tell you the truth, wherever the good news is preached throughout the world, this woman's deeds will be remembered and discussed. Now, it appears in this encounter that Jesus is accepting that the poor exist, and it's quite natural, and it's to be accepted. Would you not agree? Yeah. I even heard it used as an excuse to ignore the plight of the poor. Okay? That, that sounds crazy to me, doesn't it? Because I think whenever you read something in Scripture, you must look at the entire knowledge base that you've got who God is. And ask yourself, why is that not sitting with what I believe about God, about his character, about how he will do things? What's, why is that jangling? Because I think we can take things so far out of context just by taking one little sentence and going, oh, Jesus said the poor will always be with us. That's great then, nice. that, that's perfect, that fits my nature, that fits my desire to go and have a nice big car, that, that, that fits my desire to go and get a better job and, and loads of money and, and not give my money to people who are less fortunate than myself. Jesus says, they'll always be here and it's alright. This woman poured the most expensive jar of perfume on his head and he went, that's okay. In fact, if we know our Bibles, if we actually know what Jesus was alluding to, which the disciples who were Jewish, because Jesus came to speak to the Jews, if we understand what they would have understood from it, then we will see the correct context. You see, Jesus was alluding to something in the law. He was alluding to something that had been given to the Jews by God in Deuteronomy 15, verse 11. And he says this, There will always be some in the land who are poor. Well, that's what they would have registered, yeah? But they would also have registered in their Jewish mindset, who remember they had the law repeated to them over and over again, that's what they should have done. That would also resonate with them with the following statement that carries on from it. There will always be some in the land who are poor. That is why I am commanding you to share freely with the poor and with other Israelites in me. So Jesus wasn't saying, oh, you'll always have the poor, ignore them. He was saying, you'll always have the poor. In this instance, though, this lady is using what she's got, correctly. It's nothing about being rich and being poor, because the law's already stated, God already has laid on your hearts, God has already told you through his word, that you must look after the poor. We can't get away from the responsibilities that God places upon us. You see, we're actually without excuse anymore. As Christians, as believers, come on, let's be brave, as believers, anyone want to believe in it? <laughs> As believers, one of the things that makes you very different is that you have something going on in your life that tells you when you're doing something right and something wrong, correct? Mm -hmm. You have the Holy Spirit dwelling within you. And Jesus says the Holy Spirit is the law written on our hearts. Guess what the law said? Look after the poor. Look after the world within it. Look after yourself. Look after the people. Look after the community. See, if, we can't, if we've got the Spirit living within us as Christians, if we've got the law written on our hearts, we can't get away from the responsibility that God has given to us. We are instructed, we have our minds changed by what is, in essence, God's character changing us. We become more like Jesus, and it's a process. And guess what happens in the process? 
sometimes some of us are better at it than others day by day. And sometimes somebody who's really good at it on Tuesday last week is really pants at it by Monday. And somebody who's rubbish at it on Wednesday last week and actually found them pretty good at it by Thursday. Because our circumstances change. We live in a world which changes. We live in a world where we are struggling all the time between our dual nature. A nature which is fallen and corrupt and a nature that is trying to correct it to God's standards. And it's in a fight and a war with it. Now we've all, all experienced that. We've all gone and done things and thought, the Holy Spirit is stopping me, telling me not to do this. Haven't we? I've heard, I've heard it said that we just, you know, we, we just sin straight away and just go, I ain't sin. Oh. I've learned that sin is actually a process as well. Right? The Holy Spirit, all, I'm off script, sorry. The Holy Spirit always, always, always gives you warning. Always tells you, don't do this. Don't go any further. Stop now. In fact, when we look at God's words, you'll find that God's always saying that to his people. Stop now before you go any further. It's not too late. And as soon as you do stop, and as soon as you say, sorry, it's done. It's over. That's what we were talking about last night. We were talking about forgiveness and forgetting. God can forgive and forget. We find it very, very difficult to forget. Because we're human. We've got human nature. We can forgive, but we find it very difficult to forget. And sometimes we get dragged in because Satan knows how to, how to prod. How to ring your bell. How to kind of prod and press on you so that you actually act in a way that people will ever look at you and go, I thought you were a Christian. And you'll never have that. I, um, well, I, you know, many of you can see I've lost my finger. I jokingly say it's cut my swearing down my half. Um, I remember coming down the motorway once, so don't, kids don't repeat this, parents don't take kids. I was coming down the motorway once and I hate middle lane on hoggers. Really do my numbing. And uh, I was coming down the motorway, it was like nobody else was on the motorway, just this car in the middle. I'm thinking, what are you doing? You're not even being 70. You're just plodding along. I'm going to teach you a lesson. <laughs> I'm flashing the lights, they're not moving, right, like, okay, uh, I'm not going to go down you on the outside because that's just blind. I'm going to go past you on the inside and I'm going to let you know that I'm not very happy that you're in the middle lane, okay? Thank goodness I haven't got a fish on my car, that's all I'll say. <laughs> I came past and I'm thinking, right, well, I'm going to give him a piece of my mind and unfortunately this hand, which has uh, had two fingers on it this time, was trying to operate in the spirit of man. And as I drew level with this car, I was ready to give this car a full whack, and I suddenly realised it was a worship lead on you. <laughs> and so I went, hey! hey! <laughs> as I went past. Satan is always prodding us, always. And he's always going to start bringing your character traits and your flaws to the front. That doesn't mean you're a failure. Okay, say that to yourself. I am not a failure. <laughs> Because that's part of what we've been saying today this morning. It's part of what God's been saying to us. You are you, and it's okay to be you. It's all right to be you. God knows who you are. God will work with who you are. It's all right to be you. So, if we make mistakes, I'm trying to find you so you can see me clear. If, if, if we make mistakes and we're in this process, it means that we're not going to get everything right all the time. So don't beat yourself up when you get it wrong. Let God minister to your heart and bring you back to where he wants you to be. Let him know. Let him know, let you, let, let him know or let yourselves know, that in your heart, God is always pouring his love out to you. I love the fact that God pursues us. He never stops pursuing us. Even at the fall in the garden, even, God pursued Adam. Gives him some back clothing. You notice that? That clothing you've given yourself not good enough, here's some better, better stuff. And whenever people are doing something wrong, God's still chasing them. Here's the Lord to help you kind of live your lives properly. Here's Jesus to be sacrificed for you. And I've got all of these things, they're all they're all fulfillments of what's gone on before. If we care to read into the instructions that have been given to the Israelites throughout the Leviticus and Deuteronomy, the, you know, the books that we've found through, it's like me when you start reading your Bible and you go, oh, Genesis is a great book, it's real, full of stories, Exodus, this is great. Leviticus, oh. what? Numbers, just killing people, what's going on here? Do you try to 
Men jag har inte smält den i vilket. Jag ska ge bort den på. Actually, we need to have a fundamental understanding of what God's character is, which is revealed to us by His law to us. If we want to understand what Jesus does and how He changes our societies and our hearts in order to deal with the societies of this broken world we live in. You see, when we read the rules in the Rich of Jews, what we find is a representation of what God's justice and ideals look like in a fallen, broken world. Here's what I'd like you to do, but I know full well you can't. But really, all I'm showing you is that this is how I am, and this is how you are, and you'll always be like that until all the promises are made. All the things that I promised will happen, all the fullness of my deserving glory, they are coming and they are sure promises. See, most of the rules, and this is something that was really a an eye open to me, most of the rules actually are there to keep the Israelites safe and well, to look after them, both physically and mentally. And they were also designed to keep the unequal distribution of wealth under control. It did not mean that people could not accumulate wealth. Okay? God's law does not say, oh, you can't do this and you can't do that, everyone just must have the same amount of money every single week. It doesn't say that. Actually, people were allowed to accumulate wealth. The poor were allowed to sell property <coughs> to somebody who could afford it to live. But the law also states the gave back. It also states that all of the stuff, all of the stuff that accumulates and deteriorates, especially in the 50th year, gets given back out equally. In other words, God doesn't let it get out of control. He knows it's a state of our fallen nature, but God's saying, I'm not going to let it get out of control. And there are rules and that accept these imbalances will occur, and what they do is these rules make sure that nobody is left out. I used to think the Old Testament was just about the Israelites. Anyone else go into that shop? That's God in his life. No, let's get to where Jesus is, because that's about us now. See, even the law is about those that are destitute and don't belong to the world. The poor, the widows, the foreigners amongst you. The rules about being in the field that the book of Ruth is all about, all that comes from the law. And it's all to do with making sure the poor have got something and they're not left out. <coughs> So a particular important aspect of God's provision is the year of Jubilee. This states every 50 years any land which has been acquired should be returned to its original owners in order that anyone who falls into hardship can return to their rightful place in society. But it goes even further than this. These are instructions such as this which I will actually read in full so that we don't get any misinterpretations. So Leviticus 25. Yes, we're going for a bit on one this morning. Leviticus 25, verses 35 to 38 says this, If one of your fellow Israelites falls into poverty and cannot support himself, support him as you would a foreigner or a temporary resident and allow him to live with you. How many people have gone past somebody begging outside Asda and gone, actually the law says I should probably take him home with me, give him a bath, give him a place to put his head, give him a spare room. Treat him as a temporary resident and allow him to live with you. Do not charge interest or make a profit at his expense. Instead, show your fear of God by letting him live with you as your relative. Remember, do not charge interest on money you lend him or make a profit on food you sell him. I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt to give you the land of Canaan and to be your God. What God is saying to them is, look, you've had nothing and I've given you everything. And those that haven't got me, show me to them. Does that make sense? Who are the Israelites that they have been chosen by God? Elevated to this amazing, extraordinary position. Well, they were there just to show everybody else around that God is who he has always been. What does the church do today? Exactly the same. Exactly the same. Show our communities what God and living with God and by his standards is really like. How do we do that? By displaying heaven and kingdom life. We can change communities, folks. So God is really even-handed. Scripture is really even-handed. Those that have riches should use them to help those who do not. 
It's about treating everyone with respect and honour. And we find this a little hard to contemplate in our Western worldview. Okay, so we have other complications going on in our heads. Our worldview in the West is, well, look after yourself at the expense of anyone else. Just look after yourself. Make sure you're all right. In fact, sometimes when we look at communities that act differently to us, we kind of shy away from them because we go, well, that doesn't look like I have in my house. You know, Granny is well looked after and uh, in the home, well out of the way, thanks very much. And I'm living my life while she's over there. Next door neighbours, they build a granny flat and move the entire family in. That's because they're from another country. This happens. It's cultural differences. Now, our culture says, hey, look after yourself and you know, the, 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 the society and the things that we've paid into will look after. You know, it's not your responsibility. I think we rely too much on governments actually to do the church's work, if I'm totally honest. And then we sit back and let the government do it, and then play the government when it goes all wrong. And we sit there and go, well, they failed again. Another, another, another law they brought out that uh, feeds the rich and the poor get trampled on. It's terrible. What am I going to do about it? Well, in two years' time, I'll vote them out. I'll vote the next way, and it will do exactly the same in a different way. What's God say to you? Do something. You've got it within you to do something. It might not feel like a lot. There you go. Go and do it. Go and do this stuff. Why? What difference is it going to make? No one goes, God, why? What difference is it going to make? I've been this boat for 100 years, God. What, what difference is it making? You see, our Western worldview. When we read the Bible, some of the things don't make sense to it because we have already been trained to think another way. But other people, certainly in the biblical times, would have understood it much more readily. They would have understood what God was saying. And we see this being played out surprise, surprise in the New Testament as well. Jesus does not distinguish between rich and poor and is more concerned in how a distorted view of either could hinder someone from believing in him and receiving eternity. Receiving the time where everything is sorted out. At the establishment of the church in the book of Acts, the believers were often characterised by their provision to the poor. We can see examples of how these properties, or how those with properties to spare were encouraged to sell in order to help the poor, to give it into the church so the church can look after people. By the time we get to Acts chapter 6, the believers are even running some form of rudimentary food bank with a food distribution network to look after the poor and the widows. This is God's heart being played out in the communities that these believers now found themselves in, even in the face of extreme persecution. This is what God wants us to do. Let's do it. We were never meant to dwell with such extremities of wealth and poverty. But unfortunately, they are the products of our greed and determination to disobey all that God intended for good. It's all from us, folks. So just one quick note on this food distribution in Acts 6. When discrepancies rose amongst the various Jewish groups, the system became a little lopsided. So even the believers have still got something innate in them that is craving them not to do it as entirely as it should be. The system became a little lopsided with favouritism being shown. When this was brought to the apostles' attention, their response was this. We apostles shall spend our time teaching the word of God, not running a food program. That sounds a bit like Jesus saying, the poor will always be amongst us. Don't bother us with the poor. So we have to read on, though, because that just does not sound like God, does it? Now, before we conclude that they just didn't care... They were simply stating the importance of their calling, not ignoring the provision to the needy. So they responded by passing this responsibility on to a team of spirit-filled men to fulfil this worthwhile ministry. So that in Acts 6 verse 4, they say, we apostles can spend our time in prayer and teaching the word. 
they were not saying ignore the poor, they were saying, hey, we have to recognise that our call is this. We are the only eyewitnesses right now, so we're the ones that are going to tell people about Jesus, so that's our calling. But hey, you're right, we need to deal with this unequal distribution to the poor. We need to deal with this. So we're going to appoint people, a ministry team, to look after it, not because they didn't want to do it, but simply because they had other things that God had called them to do. Hey, we're not all called to do it, other things. But it meant that all the important functions were covered. Can you imagine if everyone in our church was a worship leader? And we all wanted to be in the front playing the guitar, which is welcome this morning, by the way, brother. Just playing. I really enjoyed that worship. But can you imagine if we all hankered to have that position and nothing else? Or we all want to be tech. No. <laughs> no. <laughs> I walked into the church this morning and I was into a shop and was like, no one told me your church colours were purple for leaders. <laughs> and so I just felt like, right, I felt right at home. I walked in, everybody's wearing purple. <laughs> Must be something going on in this place that I don't know about. See, the point here is that we can't be all things to all men. And we must recognise our individual calling, as well as the responsibility to show God's love in a much broader sense. We each have different skill sets and personalities, which can be used to engage in all facets of life. We use what we have to engage in kingdom life. So it all ties in with what's been going on at the beginning. You come as you are, and you say, God, use me. And God says, great, that's what I want. That's the heart that is a heart response to do whatever I'm calling you to do. Let's change the world. I suppose the general view would be that as ambassadors of God and upholders of his standards to those around us, we need to discipline ourselves to act accordingly. It simply isn't our natural position to go out and do these things. Sometimes we feel forced to do it. But actually, when God's heart is within us, they should start to become our natural position. So the Bible says things like we need to retrain our thinking. And now it makes sense. Because we don't think like God thinks. We think like we want to think. We need to express God's heart through our actions all the time, relying on the Holy Spirit to lead us, to guide us, teach us and change us. And it's okay to admit we can't do it on our own. It's okay to say, I can't meet these standards. God, will you help me? Because guess what? God helps us. And perhaps that's where it starts. Perhaps that's where all of these answers to the conundrums of how do we deal with life as it's thrown at us now, perhaps it starts with us. Perhaps it starts with our admission that we might not have all of the answers. But we are willing to hear God's heart and express it through our lives. The way we act towards the societies we walk and live in and amongst can change communities, can change entire communities. Working alongside food banks or community initiatives for the elderly and the lonely, working like I do as a street pastor with the homeless. All these things bring God's presence and kingdom life here now. And we keep on keeping on. We keep striving to do all that we can do to help. It's not wrong to have riches, but use your wealth as God intended to help those in need. That's, that's the take out. That's the, that's the cover all. That's what God said in the Old Testament. That's what Jesus was saying when he was walking this earth. That's what the church did in Acts. And guess what? We're all ready for Jesus to return again. So there's no wonderful cut off that says, oh, that was just for them. And we are now living in a different time where we don't apply those rules. We apply the same rules. Use your wealth as God intended to help those in need. We share Jesus as we do so. Which brings us to the end of our God. Brings us to the end of this time on earth that we've navigated to the end of. We've prepared for Jesus' return in glory as King over the whole earth. And I love the word whole. 
Because it just doesn't mean about the earth. It means your wholeness. It means your completeness. The completeness of all of his creation. Of which you are, surprise, surprise, the people. In fact, he cares more about you than anything else, and he expects us to look after all of the resources that we've been given. Whether it be the world that we live in, whether it be our wealth and distribution of wealth as we have things given to us. If God blesses us, let's bless others with it. I'll finish with this Matthew 25, verse 34, well known passage. Come, you who are blessed by my Father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the creation of the world. Okay, so right back at the beginning, it was all done for you. For I was hungry and you fed me, I was thirsty and you gave me a drink. I was a stranger and you invited me into your home. I was naked and you gave me clothing. I was sick and you cared for me. I was in prison and you visited me. Then those righteous ones will reply, Lord, when do we ever see you hungry and feed you? Or thirsty and give you something to drink? Or a stranger and show you hospitality? Or naked and give you clothing? When do we ever see you sick or in prison and visit you? And the king will say, I tell you the truth, when you did it to one of the least of these, my brothers and sisters, you were doing it to me. The king is coming. He's coming to bring an end to all of the injustices and all of the imbalances that we see all around us every single day. Just as it was in a perfect people, before the fall, we will have everything we need and there's nothing that we don't so I want to encourage you with that I hope that that has fit into the, the kind of what we said this morning if we could let the Lord speak to them I think it has I believe that God is trying to say something to us I believe he's trying to get our attention that we are all unique we're not all the same don't let one person say because I do this you must okay. that's the trap for you as well you're you, and God has given you unique personalities, unique skills, and He's given you His love in order to love the person who stands you next to. Use it. Thank you.